Good evening, guys. Happy Wednesday. I'm going to uh, pick up where we left off with making bombs for Hitler. And we have two short chapters today. So where we last left off, we read two chapters yesterday. And um, Lida had been rescued because uh, the camp had been, uh, where they were at, had been liberated. And um, she had some really bad cuts and things. And one of the nurses took care of her. I know that she was really scared, like, getting put into the showers. Um, and you guys were probably thinking the same thing I was thinking, was that the reason that she was so terrified was because that was very similar to what the gas chambers were like where um, they had been put in and exterminated. So uh, she was actually clean with real shampoo and real soap that smelled really good, smelled like lilacs and medicine put on her feet. She got, um, her feet were getting better. She got wool socks and real shoes um so she was feeling really uh really um a lot better and then she met up with Luca again at this camp and got to see this wall of it was pretty much like a wall of prayers where people were trying to find their lost loved ones and so she, of course, was looking for her sister, Larissa. So we're going to pick up where we left off. And this is chapter 20, which is titled The Lucky Ones. Life in the displaced per person's camp settled into a routine. Each morning, we children would gather together in a makeshift classroom to be taught Ukrainian and English spelling and grammar, arithmetic, history, geography. For so long, I had pretended to be older than I was, and it was difficult for me to be clustered together with other 12-year-olds. Many of these children had lived through conditions as difficult as my own, but a few had managed to stay with a parent or grandparent throughout the war. These few lucky ones seemed so separate and special. Did I dare admit how jealous I was of them? I knew it wasn't fair of me to feel that way, but every time I looked at the lucky ones, I felt unbearably lonely. I was grateful to be with Luca, but I had to find Larissa, and it wasn't just to ensure that she was safe. I needed to find her for my own sake. We were sisters, after all. After all. We shared the same family, childhood, even thoughts. With her gone, half of me was gone as well. My teacher was a former high school instructor from live named Pani Zimluk, and she was demanding and precise in her expectations. Often, after all the other children had gone off to play, I would stay at my spot on the bench made from a plank of wood and two empty paint tins, my workbook open on my knees. I was determined to master my schoolwork, especially the English language. It was such a gift to finally be given the opportunity to learn. Pani Zimluk, would come and sit beside me, correcting my errors and giving me extra exercises when I wanted them. We would talk. I confided to her my hopes and dreams of finding Larissa. I confessed to her what I did in the war. I wept on her shoulder as I admitted to accepting the candy from that Nazi woman and how selfish, and how selfishness had destroyed my family. It's not your fault, she said. What starving child would say no to a sweet? Those women were trained to capture children. Pani Zemlock advised me to change my identity. You cannot let people know that you're from Chernivska. That is the Soviet part of Ukraine, and everyone from there is being sent back to the Soviet Union. But I want to go home. Your home no longer exists. Besides, you are a laborer for the Nazis. If you go back to the Soviet Union, you will be punished for that. I rubbed the tears away with the back of my hand and stared at her. That makes no sense, I said. I was a prisoner of the Nazis. No matter. You will be punished as a Nazi. 
They already know my true identity at the hospital, I told her. Besides, if I change who I am, how can I ever find my sister? Pawnee Zumlump brushed away a stray hair from my brow and looked me in the eye. Your first job is to save yourself, Lida. You have been very lucky so far, but if you don't stay free, you and your sister can never hope to be reunited. Her words shattered me. Luca was in the spiraling lineup of refugees at lunchtime. Once we each got a bowl brimming with hot pea soup and a handful of crackers, we walked down the pathway to the makeshift church. It was cool there and quiet and at midday. We sat side by side on the ground, leaning against the wall. I filled my spoon with thick soup and blew on it, waiting for it to cool down just a bit. I didn't actually like the taste of pea soup. We'd been served it more than any other food, but it filled my stomach and staved off the gnawing hunger that seemed always to be present. I swallowed down the first spoonful, then as I waited for the next to cool, I watched Luca. He shoveled down the soup, piping hot. The look on his face was one of urgency, as if he was afraid someone would take the food away from him if he didn't consume every last speck instantly. Have you heard anything about your mother? I asked him. He shook his head and continued eating. I swallowed down another spoonful of soup. Then as I stared at my bowl, I told Luca about what Pawnee Zimlock had said. Luca didn't answer right away. He was too involved with licking every last bit of soup from the bottom of his bowl. When he was finished, he methodically ate his crackers, chewing each one with gusto. Once he swallowed down the last cracker, he turned to me and said, I think she's wrong. His words confused me. So you think we should go back to the Soviet Union? I haven't heard anything about my mother, said Luca. But this morning, some Red Army, some Red Army soldiers came into my classroom and asked to speak to me. His words made my heart pound. What did they want? They told me that my father is alive and that he is living in Kiev. He's got his own pharmacy. That, that's wonderful, Luca. They are coming back tomorrow morning. They will take me home. His words were like a stone in my heart. I had no idea if I would ever find Larissa, but Luca was right here with me. He was the brother of my heart. How could I bear to lose him yet again? Was I destined to be all alone? I didn't say anything. I stared at the soup in my bowl, but suddenly I had no appetite. Luca's finger gently brushed a tear away from my cheek. You could come with me, he said. Should I? Could I? But if I went back to the Soviet Union and Larissa was living somewhere in Germany, how would I ever find her? It was all too overwhelming. There was too much to think about. I'm leaving tomorrow morning no matter what, said Luca. Come and say goodbye to me or just come and join me. Your choice. Chapter 21. Luca leaving. All night I tossed and turned. How wonderful it would be to go home again and help rebuild all that had been lost. Maybe I could go to Kiev with Luca. Maybe his father would adopt me and then I would truly be Luca's sister. But what if Pawnee Zemlock was right? Even if she was wrong, there was one thing I knew to be true. If I went with Luca now, I would never find Larissa. No place could be home without my sister. I got up at dawn the next morning and found Luca. He had just a small cloth satchel with all his worldly goods, a prayer book that had been given to him by a priest, a notebook from his teacher, and a second set of clothing. We walked together to the stone wall with its flutter with its flutter prayers of paper, and waited for the Red Army truck. We weren't the only ones waiting there. Three older men had congregated as well, two who had been slave laborers and one who had been a prisoner of war. It was a tired and sorry-looking group. Pawnee Zemlock also came. Her eyes widened in astonishment when she saw me standing beside Luca. Just then, the Red Army truck appeared at the end of the road. It approached slowly, spewing up billows of dust. Will you come with me? asked Luca. Pawnee Zimluck stepped forward, 
stepped forward and put her hand on my shoulder. Lida, don't. I studied her face. It was filled with concern and fear. I turned to Luca. His eyes looked serious, but he was hopeful as well. I took a deep breath. It was now or never. I cannot go with you. He set down his satchel and wrapped his arms around me. I wish you would come with me, but I understand why you can't right now. Stay safe, sister of my heart. I will find a way to write to you when I meet my father in Kiev. Maybe one day you and your sister will join us. I would like that. The canvas-colored truck pulled up just then, and the sight of it made me panic. It looked so much like the truck that had transported me from the slave camp to my final prison. It would have been the, it could have been the same one, except where the swastika had been, a red star enclosing a hammer and a, a red star enclosing a hammer and sickle. The truck careened to a stop in a swirl of dust and red fi- and fresh faced red army officer stepped out. He took he took in the three older men and ticked off their names on a clipboard. He approached Luca and me. You must be Luca Bar Barukovich of Kiev, he said in perfect Ukrainian to Luca. But who are you? He crouched down so his hazel eyes were level with mine. He smiled. Are you coming home with us today? He seemed clean, friendly, and relaxed. This soldier seemed nothing like those thugs who had taken my father. Maybe I had been wrong about all this. Maybe they had changed. How I longed to go with Luca. I dreaded being here all alone, but I couldn't go just yet. I need to find my sister first. The Soviet Red Cross can help with that. He poised his pencil over his clipboard. What is your sister's name, and where were you two born? I opened my mouth to answer, but was startled by a hand gripping my shoulder so tightly that it hurt. I looked up. Pani Zemlock's lips smiled, but her eyes were serious. Children should be seen and not heard. I was about to protest, but noticed the anger that washed over the Red Army officer's expression as he put his pencil away. With his friendly mask down for just that brief moment, I'd had a glimpse of the bully behind it. The teacher kept a tight grip on my shoulder, almost as if she had to keep me in that place. I looked at Luca. Please stay here with me. I must go back, Lida, he said, a touch of impatience in his voice. My father is waiting for me. With that, Luca tossed his satchel into the back of the truck and climbed in under the canvas. The other three joined Luca, and the officer got into the driver's seat and sped off. I walked out onto the street with Pani Zemlock at my side and watched them go, listening to the refrains of the Soviet national anthem from the back of the truck. When they were out of sight, Pani Zemlock loosened her grip on my grip on my shoulder. Never tell the Soviets who you really are. I pointed to the fluttering bits of paper on the convent pillar. Each of those gives a name and where the person is from. Pani Zemlock nodded, and the Soviets check those regularly. I had much to think about as I walked back through the gates of the refugee camp. Luca was gone and I was all alone. I prayed that he would be all right and I hoped that I had made the right decision in staying. I passed a group of small children who were playing tag, screaming delightedly at one another as they darted through the legs of older refugees. No one seemed to mind. The sight of happy children had been all too rare these past years. Seeing those smiles made me think of Larissa What would she be doing right now? If that really had been her in the car outside the bomb factory, she wouldn't be in a refugee camp. She would never put her name on a fluttering piece of paper. Wherever she was, I hoped she was safe. I got my tin cup, spoon, and bowl from my sleeping area and stood at the end of the snaking lineup of people who were waiting for breakfast. Each morning as I did this, it made me think of eating this horrible sawdust bread and colored water for months on end. The food at this refugee camp was not tasty, but I never complained. It filled my stomach better than sawdust and turnip ever did. 
In the weeks that I'd been at the camp, hundreds of hundreds more homeless people had poured in, yet the Americans had somehow provided food, and they scraped together bedding and soap as best they could. As I looked at the long column of people ahead of me, I noticed the ingenious for ingenious variety of clothing that people had been able to patch together for themselves. A young girl up ahead wore the red of the Nazi flag as a kerchief for her hair, and the man in front of me had patched his shirt with a paper memo about typhus. The woman behind me had woven a pair of sandals out of old newspapers. Many people wore remnants of Nazi uniforms, a jacket with the sleeves cut off, or trousers rolled up. But even with the insignia ripped off, the sight of that clothing sickened me. When it was finally my turn for breakfast, I held up my bowl to the tired-looking American private with a sheen of sweat on his brow. He dipped his ladle into the giant vat and swirled it. I watched as he filled my bowl to the brim with yet another helping of thick pea soup. People who had been at the camp for a while hated this pea soup and had nicknamed it the Green Horror but I could eat it every day and not complain. Anything but turn up. I carefully balanced my bowl and looked for a quiet place to eat. I ended up going back to the barn, wishing that Luca was with me. I sat down on the ground, leaning against the barn wall. From this vantage point, I could watch the activity of the refugee camp, but I was by myself. I dipped my spoon into the hot green mush and brought the first spoonful to my lips. I savored every drop, closing my eyes and letting the thickness of the soup cover my tongue and coat my teeth before slowly, before slowly swallowing it down. It felt so good to be filling my stomach with real food. Lida, can that possibly be you? I was jolted out of my reverie and nearly dropped my bowl. My eyes flew open. There stood a girl just a bit older than me. Her hair was blonde and silky clean, and her cheeks were pink with a touch of sun. The voice was familiar, and the patch of dark blue flannel on her threadbare dress meant that she had been in barracks seven at the work camp. All at once, I realized who she was. Natalia? She nodded, grinning. I carefully set my half-eaten bowl of soup on the ground and jumped up, wrapping my arms around her, making sure not to spill any of her soup either. We both knew how precious every drop of food was. She hugged me back, and we sat down, our shoulders touching as we leaned against the barn and ate our breakfast in silence. Once we were finished, I asked her, When did you get here? Late last night. Where from? I've been going from camp to camp looking for my family. There was a group of us who arrived late last night. Have you found any of your family? She shook her head. What about Katerina and Xenia? We escaped the work camp together and hid in the woods for weeks, she said. But Katerina was killed. She stepped on a landmine. Poor Katerina. My heart ached at the thought of her dead. And Xenia? I was almost afraid to ask. <coughs> she and I hid in a few places, but mostly the root cellar of a bombed-out house until the spring. We survived on old potatoes and whatever else we could scrounge. We were picked up by the British together, said Natalia. The British sorted the refugees, so she was taken to a Jewish camp and I was taken to one for Poles. I visited her a week ago, and she seems happy, all things considered. They've got her working in the kitchen, and she likes that. I placed my hand over my crucifix and felt its warmth. Thank goodness Xenia was safe. She had lost so much already. I hoped that she would find a community in that camp. Have you heard anything about Luca? asked Natalia. As a matter of fact, I have. I told her how he'd been at the camp for the last few weeks and that he had just left before breakfast to go back to Kiev. They say his father is alive. Natalia looked at me uneasily. I hope for Luca's sake that they're telling him the truth. I guess
we'll find out tomorrow whether they are or they aren't. See you then, guys.